So this is Sergeant Goodchild of Active Healing from Massachusetts. Now tell me, Sergeant, what is the one thing you want a parent of a learning disabled or brain injured child to know? Well, uh, first I'll say I'm so thrilled to be here. The, uh, this has been a great opportunity, so thank you for this. Um, I would say the one thing that I would want the parent of a brain injured or learning disabled um, child to know is that the movement disorder that they're likely seeing in their child, a lot of these kids have awkward gaits, or they're clumsy, they trip, they stumble, or there was something odd about the way that they went through a developmental milestone. Maybe they never crawled on their bellies, or maybe when they crept and they should have been up on hands and knees, maybe they were scooting on their bottom. Those are not separate and distinct from the learning disability or the brain injury that, that is challenging them, but it's actually central to what's going on because our bodies and our brains are formed around the functions that we perform. So if you're a swimmer, right, and you're heading out and you're getting in the pool at 5 a.m. every morning and you're being coached, you're probably not just being coached on how you swim, but you're being coached on what you should be eating and how you should be taking care of your body, both physically and hopefully emotionally too. Um, and all of those functions that you're performing, the fact that you're you're choosing salads and kale and stuff like that over pizza and beer, those are functions. The function of how you're eating is going to have a direct correlation to the health of your physical body. But that analogy can be drawn out even further. And the functions that we perform, such as the swimming, right? Swimmers have a very specific body style. Um, the functions that we perform on a physical level not only help do things like crawling on your stomach, crawling on your belly in a military type of pattern is what arches the bottoms of your feet. It's what stretches the heel cord from where the heel cord attaches at the back of the heel all the way to behind the knee. It's what helps wear a hip socket. It helps develop the primary and secondary curves in the back. It helps build a deeper chest capacity. It helps build your lungs. It develops all your proprioception and your tactility in your body. It shapes the way that your eyes and your hands are coordinated together in that eye-hand movement. There are so many things that go into crawling, and that's only on a physical level. On a neurological level, it's actually working on very specific areas of your brain. So when a child doesn't go through one of these movements the way that they should, it can create a brain that's not as stable and as integrated as it should be. So uh, an example of this that um, the people who are watching this may be able to relate to more directly. If we look at the body type of a sprinter, someone like a Usain Bolt, he's a runner, right? So much of his life, like a swimmer, would be spent sprinting. But you look at his body, and then you look at the body of the guy who who won the Boston Marathon this year, he's a runner as well, right? But they have completely disparate body types. Usain Bolt is like a Greek god. It looks like someone chiseled him out of marble. And the guy who won the Boston Marathon, and this isn't a slight in any way, but it's a completely different body type. There's no real lean muscle there. He looks almost skeletal, right? Everything's, mm -hmm. and yet, they both do the same thing, they both run, but the way that they've applied their running has led to two completely different body types. So you can have two kids who both learn how to crawl on their stomach, but they can do it in very different ways that leads them in a very different trajectory as far as their brain health and their future intellectual and academic success and behavioral and et cetera. So what we do with neurological reorganiz reorganization is we go back and we look for evidence that this child has not passed through a developmental stage in the way that they should have. And then my job, after I identify what that stage is, is to train the parents to facilitate the healthy acquisition of whatever skill the child is missing. So yeah. the, the bottom line, again, is that you can never separate this idea of function and structure, right? Structure is always going to impact function, and function is always going to impact structure, right? So if I, if I dislocate your hip, 
and throw you into the pool, what's going to happen? You're going to drown, right? Or you're going to have a really hard time staying afloat and you're certainly not going to be able to compete, right? Because I've structurally changed something about your body that is going to change the way that your body's able to function. So we can make a structural change in the body and that's how a lot of this stuff happens is that there's birth trauma, you know, there's over obstetric manipulation of the neck or there's vacuum extraction of their forceps or there's cesarean section. A lot of times that's kind of the first sort of structural insult that the kid receives. It can go, you can go back from there. It can be an epidural, it can be Pitocin. All of these, which are functions, right? The, the function of having an epidural and a Pitocin changes the way that, that the birth proceeds. So if, if we're talking about just general parents, you know, or, or people who are thinking about becoming parents, one of the things that we want them to do is we want them to think about the consequences of what most people don't think about. You know, that there is a consequence. For every action, there's a consequence. So there is a consequence for epidurals and there's a consequence for Pitocin. And oftentimes, those things are absolutely necessary in order for the child to, to be born in the least traumatic way possible. But oftentimes, they actually cause traumatization. And that's okay, as long as we know that there has been a consequence and we're going to have to do something about it in the future. But when we just think, oh, we can throw an epidural and Pitocin and mom and nothing's going to happen and baby's going to be fine, that's not necessarily the case because it can change the way the child is born and that can pervert right from that point on how that child is able to progress through what should be a healthy developmental process. Tell me a little bit more about the masking and what it is. So the masking is what, um, what Dr. Klinghart has brought me in to speak about. Um, and it's one, of the, it's one of the core elements of many of the programs that we do. A lot of the kids that I see at Active Healing have been raised on their backs. And again, that's a function, right? The function of being raised on your back is going to have structural implications. You're going to have hips that are externally rotated, you're going to have ankles that are externally rotated, you're not breathing against the gravity of your body weight, so your chest isn't going to be as well developed, your lungs therefore aren't going to be as well developed, you may have a flat spot in the back of your head. So the function of being, we're not, functionally we're not meant to be raised on our backs. Functionally we are designed to be raised on our stomachs. And there's a reason that the Back to Sleep campaign has been successful with regards to SIDS, but I, I don't have time to get into that right now. So when these kids come in, one of the big factors can be that they haven't developed the lung and chest capacity to really fully oxygenate their brains. And so as an adult, we can go and we can do a yoga class, or we can jump into the pool and we can swim, or we can go out and we can run. We can do something to try to build our, our, our ability to breathe deeply. But then we sit in the car and we're in traffic and we've got to get groceries and we've got to pick the kid up at school and we completely forget and we go, we get into our little shallow breathing, right? Masking, the technical word for masking is hypercapnia and what we do is we have the child rebreathe or the individual, it's not necessarily a child, rebreathe their own exhaled carbon dioxide. And when we do that for long enough, the carbon dioxide acts as a trigger there are chemoreceptors that are responsible for monitoring the amount of oxygen to carbon dioxide ratios in our blood. And when we upset that balance in favor of the carbon dioxide, the body responds with two reflexes. One is it forces us to breathe from the lower lobes of our lungs. So we start breathing very deeply. And the other is we get vasodilation to the brain. 